Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Jewelry Industry Voices webinar for this month, the month of May. Please feel free to use the chat box to connect with other industry professionals from all around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much to all of you for giving us some of your valuable time today. Welcome back to many of you, but welcome for the first time to some of you as well. This is our gemstone community, friends and colleagues from the jewelry and gemstone industries from all around the world. We love to hear where you are. We love to hear what the weather's like wherever you are. Here in London, it's pretty miserable. And in fact, in the UK generally, it snowed in Scotland this morning, the first time it has snowed in May in UK in many, many decades. Welcome to Jewelry Industry Voices. This is the webinar series that is hosted by Sibjo and aims to bring us together to look at issues of interest in the jewelry business from the perspective of industry figures. We started this series just over a year ago on April the 22nd, 2020. It was a response to the pandemic, along with many other webinars that started around the same time. But it was a response in the best traditions of Sibjo under the leadership of Gaetano Cavalieri. It sent a message of positive collaboration and brought us together at a time of need. Since then, we have delivered 25 webinars. Today's number 26. We've had over 10,000 views, and we have an average of 440 views per webinar. I can see that we have 225 people with us today, and that's rising. So thank you very much for spending your time to be with us. We've also been very grateful over the months that we've been running these to receive so many positive comments from all around the world about the value and the knowledge that these in events have delivered. So I just wanna take a moment to thank you all, our guests, our panelists, and our sponsors for your support in this past year. Without you, our conversations would not have been as much benefit to so many during the past challenging years. Now, we expect this webinar to last one hour or usually slightly longer when the conversation is fruitful. It is being recorded and it will be available to view on Sibjo's YouTube channel by tomorrow. Let me get started by thanking our sponsor for today. We extend our gratitude to Veronica, Philippe, Patricia and all at GemCloud for their support and collaboration as our technology sponsor. GemCloud is a Bangkok-based software company developing products specifically tailored for the colored gemstone industry. Founded by a, a group of gemstone and jewelry experts, they aim to transform the industry by creating so much value for each of their vendors that their businesses practically run themselves. So again, welcome to Jewelry Industry Voices. My name is Edward Johnson. I'll be one of the moderators today. And I'm joined in Tel Aviv by my colleague, Steve Benson. If I can pause for a moment. On behalf of Sibjo, GemCloud, and our panelists, I would like us all now to briefly pause and reflect on the many lives lost and impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
our thoughts at this time go especially to our friends in India and to the friends and family of our dear colleague, Jean-Claude Michelou, who very sadly this week lost his own battle against the virus. If I can ask you to pause briefly in reflection. Thank you very much. Can I pass us on now and give the stage to President Gaetano Cavalieri to say a few welcoming words? Thank you very much, uh, Edward. And uh, let me thank all our panelists and friends uh, and all those that are following us. Uh, thank you for uh, the fact that you are witnessing what we are doing and believe me, we are making a lot of effort in order to spread out uh, uh, the voice of the industry. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, we do not have, this will uh, certainly be uh, reminded by Edward, uh, whatever will be said, we do not have any specific responsibility, but we are a supporter of democracy and we accept every voice uh, uh, in the industry. I would like myself to express my thank, uh, not only to all of you, but uh, to all the friends that uh, in these last couple of days have joined us. Uh, and on the contrary, we have joined also them re uh, remembering how Jean-Claude was uh, a very good person, a good friend to me, and we have enjoyed many times. I can never forget his uh, special uh, activity and attention uh, throughout the world in every single forum we have met. And I had the pleasure to have him guest uh, in the Sibjo Congress in Bogota. So I want to again wish you all the very best and whatever we can helping our people in the industry all over the world. We are ready to do that. Staying on the telephone many hours a day uh, uh, with friends in India, in Brazil, in America, in Canada, in China, in Australia and wherever. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Gaetano. Let's get started and let me introduce our panelists for today. Firstly, Michael Jemnitsky. Michael is director at the Swiss Gemological Institute, SSCF, an internationally renowned gem laboratory based in Basel, where he has worked for more than 20 years. He is a lecturer at the University of Basel and supervises gemology related research projects in Switzerland and internationally. He is a member of many important boards, including for the Swiss Gemological Society, the International Gemological Conference, and also for SIBJU. Good afternoon, Michael. It's nice of you to be with us. The community was not able to be with you in Basel this year. We're sorry about that, but we hope everything is well in that wonderful Swiss city. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm very fine. I mean, the weather is maybe not as bad as in England, but still we have rain. So we hope for a better springtime in the next few days. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's fly all the way across to Seattle on the west coast of the United States. Monica Stevenson is up bright and early for us. Thank you very much, Monica. Monica founded the responsible gemstone company Anza Gems in 2015. Anza fuels development in Kenya and Tanzania through responsible gemstone purchasing and supports education initiatives in mining communities. In 2019, she collaborated with the NGO non-governmental organization PACT, the Tanzanian Women Miners Association, Everledger, and Everledger, excuse me, on Moyo Gems, 
which is a traceable model to bring gems from women miners in Tanzania to the international market. Monica, thank you so much for being with us and thank you for getting up so early to be with us today. How are you? Very well, it's my pleasure. It is early, it's actually light out now. So that makes me feel like the day is starting. So thank you for asking. The day is all uphill from here. So thank you very much <laughs> for being with us. Next, let's go across to Singapore and welcome Risha Goyal Sikri. Risha is a creative strategist, journalist and storyteller specializing in colored gems, diamonds and jewelry. She is an MBA with a specialization in marketing and she began her career in the travel and tourism industry. Risha started documenting her gem journeys to mines, manufacturing hubs and artist studios and museums in 2013 on Instagram. And now she has built a curated audience of over 43,000 viewers with her educational posts and insights. Risha, it's a great privilege to have you with us. I follow you along with many other people in Instagram and it's so great to see you with us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that lovely introduction and for inviting me to share my views on this uh, esteemed panel. I'm, um, I've been attending these webinars and um, and looking forward to the conversation today and to audience participation, which is quite high from the chat. So just want to say hi to everyone. And thank you also for um, those wonderful words for Jean-Claude, who was my editor uh, with In Color and also sending thoughts and prayers to everyone affected with this terrible virus these days. Indeed, thank you for those words. And, and yes, please do um, use the chat to communicate and to, to connect with each other. We, we find that people really enjoy that. We know that for some people, they say these messages pop up on their screen and it's distracting, but on balance, we feel that it's nice to be connected. Last but definitely not least, we turn to Dr. Ashton Stewart Carter. Ashton is a pioneering consultant who has been at the forefront of responsible sourcing and corporate sustainability for more than 25 years. TDI Sustainability, the Dragonfly Initiative, the advisory firm he is the CEO of, is the driving force behind the Colored Gemstone Working Group, which is a group which unites leading brands and mining companies. The group has supported two important projects launched online recently to drive positive change within the Gemstone supply chain. Firstly, the Gemstone and Jewelry Community Platform, and also Sibjo's own responsible sourcing toolkit. Ashton, good afternoon to you. You're off in the beautiful countryside of the Cotswolds, I believe. Yeah, hi there, Edward, yes, good afternoon. And unlike where you are, it's very sunny here. <laughs> it's always sunny in our part of Eng England. <laughs> But very good, to, very good to see you all and to be part of this panel. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Now today, we're gonna to go back to our roots, back to the roots of the colored gemstone trade, the origin, the places, the environments, and most importantly, the people who were the first step in bringing gems out of the earth and starting them on their journey to the sales counter. These people and places should be the first to benefit from the resources they have. Sadly, as we know, that is not always the case. So today we're discussing the challenges and the opportunities in gemstone origin and in using gemstone origin, both technologically, but also scientifically, and also within the framework of the growing areas of sustainability, traceability, responsible sourcing, but also importantly, in marketing and sales to the consumer. When we're determining origin, we wanna think about that from the starting point that the industry, the colored gemstone industry has been determining origin for quite a number of decades already. The science and the practice of gemology 
started as a discipline to identify and characterize gemstones in the early, early 20th century. Since the 1980s, developing scientific methodologies to determine either geological or geographical origin has grown in importance. So Michael, I'd like to turn to you as the gemologist and the scientist in the group. Can you tell us about the history of origin determination from a gemological and scientific standpoint and why it has traditionally been a very important tool for the gem trade? Yes, for sure. I mean, as you said, actually, the beginning of gemological lab work and testing was rather characterization. So let's say the pearl, the culture pearls coming into the market in the 20s of the 20th century or synthetic uh, stones, which were mixed into uh, parcels of natural stones. So that was a traditional type of work where already scientific equipment was necessary and used. And as uh, it is obvious, since about the 80s, the origin determination has become a task for labs to give an independent assessment on origins. I mean, the origin of a stone has played a role since many centuries, I would say, because historically some mines were relevant and important and highly regarded. And it's always these kind of labels which played a certain role in the trade. This is a very old uh, kind of uh, situation, but now, in the 80s, this was the question to independently and scientifically um, give in an assessment on an origin. And actually, this is a very fascinating story because, I mean, the more we uh, go into this, we see it's actually bridging now gemology, pure gemology, which is, which is rather a material science, so testing material with other scientific fields. And the most important here is geology and mineralogy. So how is a gemstone formed in nature? What is the context? What is the rock type in which it forms? And what are the conditions? We need to understand this background to fully be aware how to attribute uh, an origin because a work as a gem lab is rather like forensics. You have the finished product, the cut stone, and you try to deduct back from which setting it comes first geologically and on a second step to say, okay, now with this geological environment, we have this and this geographic options. At the very end, we can say uh, this is an evolution which for sure has show, seen uh, quite important uh, ad advance because of instrumentations which have been developed, which have allowed us to gain much more data now than we have had maybe 20, 30 years ago. So it's parallel to other fields of science that this science will constantly evolve. So what we now know today is not the end. Our knowledge scientifically will go on and it's actually helpful for us because also the challenges are getting more. We have more deposits coming. We have more questions where more stones also where it's required to give uh, an opinion on the origin. What we do finally scientifically is we want to gain information about the structure of the material, about uh, the chemical composition, trace elements, about isotopes, distribution in a material. And it's obvious the more information we have, the more options we have also to find the or the uh, these criteria which help us to separate different uh, origins and instruments which we use now are Raman microspectroscopy, we use infrared spectroscopy, we use chemical analysis and for sure some of you may have heard mass spectrometry using a laser which is called laser ablation ICP mass spectrometry or as what we use at SSF which is like the uh, the latest development in this is a so-called time of flight mass spectrometry. So, I mean, these, these new techniques give us a, a plenty of information. And the more we learn, the more we see that with this knowledge, we have also a lot of data. And this is the second part where we see science makes uh, developments. 
which are helpful because we have a big amount of data and this data needs to be processed. So the term which is now quite uh, obvious uh, is uh, machine learning or some use artificial intelligence, which I would say is, is not really the right term for this, but it's supporting uh, computer software and statistical algorithm which help us to deduct even more clear criteria to make origin determination. So what you see is actually what started with a very simple tool of microscopy now is getting more complex still. And I think that's the beauty of also my job here in the lab is at the very end, the microscope is still key. So looking into a stone tells you a lot, tells you a story about treatments, tells you a story about also the origin. So you cannot expect to have a black box. You put the stone inside and you get the result and everything is done. So it's a combination work. It's finally an interpretation work needed. And that's why an expert will come to an opinion finally of an origin. I mean, this is in some cases very straightforward. In other cases, it might be not so straightforward. And I think this is as it is, maybe we can also say origin can be understood also a little bit in, on a wider range in terms of a historical origin. So at some point, as we do on pearls, we can also test the age of the pearl and say, okay, this pearl, the origin historically spoken can be proven. It is a historical pearl or it is a very recent pearl. And the story which is coming along is just not fitting with our data. Yeah, sorry. No, that's fine. Thank you. I mean, what what of course is important to to understand here is that the information that you can gather can can support in telling the story, whether it's the origin in terms of time or the origin in terms of when absolutely. it started its journey in the supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you have a service called Gem Track. Tell us briefly, if you can, a, a little bit about that and how it fits into the availability to start that storytelling option for people selling gems and jewelry. Absolutely. I mean, the normal procedure and normal service is just a gemstone report where we just give our opinion on an origin. Now, gem track is a, a different uh, kind of view because here we track a stone, the journey of a stone throughout, uh, let's say, the trade. And it can start with a rough stone, which we need to see at this stage. And it comes back as a cut stone, and we can compare the data and the observation, and we can actually confirm, yes, it is the same stone. So this can happen several times, even if the stone is later than set in a jewelry, we get back the item and have a look into it. And as we have all data always available of each stone, we can actually track it throughout this whole chain. And important, we can and we do issue a, a, a document, a tracking document, which then can be integrated in whatever other uh, tracking option you use, whether it's a blockchain or uh, just a, a gemstone management system, doesn't matter too much, but we actually scientifically can track it through this whole process. So that's right. the SSF gem track. I mean, similar solutions are offered by other labs because it's obvious our scientific background, we can do this. Thank you for that. I, now that we've heard the, the gemological, the scientific uh, reasons and, and the importance of origin determination, I'd like to turn Ashton to you. Um, why is knowing where the gemstone comes from important in terms of sustainability and responsibility and is it possible to separate origin from traceability um thanks edward um yeah so you're 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 right to point out the traceability of origin um, in gemstones and all materials um, used in jewelry in fact has become uh, more and more important you just have to look at the slew of traceability schemes emerging that are linked to responsible sourcing to know that and for sure, all our clients and partners across the sectors that we work in are focusing this year on how to get greater visibility up their supply chain. Um, I think it's been made important because of risk management. Um, and I'll come back to um, the implications of that in a minute and maybe later in the conversation. 
Um, and in particular, um, conflict minerals um, in you know, emerging way over a decade ago, two decades ago, two decades ago, when we talk about conflict um, diamonds. And but this phenomenon, this concern about conflict minerals has really set us on the path we're on now on traceability. Um, and, you know, as we know, colored uh, uh, conflict minerals um, which are predominantly um, uh, tin, tungsten, tantalum and gold are not gemstones at all, uh, but that hasn't stopped the responsible, um, responsible sourcing movement from um, coming into, into the gemstones area. And the thing about conflict in minerals, although it implies a social phenomenon and interruption to a desired social state, you know, people want peace and conflict is undermining that peace, the legislation that has arisen around it and the regulations that have arisen around that um, although laudable um, intent to stamp out conflict have, um, are all place based by which I mean that the lawmakers when putting pen to paper defined a conflict mineral as a particular, in, as a particular part of the world um, in, in Africa in particular. And conflict diamonds too, of course, are strongly associated with certain um, countries. So in fact, the you know, de facto standard setting organizations such as the OECD, they intend and um, they may take great pains, in fact, to clarify that we should think about the actual impact on the ground, the risk that they um, want to us to avoid or to mitigate um, um, and put in place good practices to mitigate. They, um, they tend to kind of push us towards um, certain places, certain countries in the world. And that idea is hard to dislodge. So when brands are, are sourcing and looking at traceability, the temptation is to look at place um, and very often um, whole countries. So witness the idea of conflict affected and high risk areas. This is supposed to be about areas um, within a country, but if you look at the tools that are used to enable um, risk managers and supply chain managers to um, conform to the certain compliance requirements, they color whole countries from different shades of red, red to green. So yes, traceability of origin has become, has been made important, um, but there's a, a, a risk here of unintended con consequences if we're not careful, because uh, the risk-based nature of traceability standards is designed to seek out risk. And so risks they'll find, but they don't balance that with the benefits. And so we tend to get, if we're not very careful, an imbalanced picture of the state of production or the conditions under which um, gemstones are um, produced and we don't get the context. And the temptation then is to exclude um, uh, small businesses from the supply chain rather than find ways to include them. Yeah. So what we really need from traceability, I think in the next, um, as this movement kind of um, matures, is first of all, we need to be more, more, more precise. We don't want to label whole countries a certain color of risk. Um, we need to understand the operating um, practices of specific businesses within the supply chain rather than uh, exclude them de facto. And we need to understand the context of the economics, political, social, environmental context. And this would enable good decision-making, but it's clearly a, a difficult thing to do. It's um, currently expensive. And some of the technologies we hear about may, may reduce that cost. And it needs uh, a little bit more sophisticated interpretation um, downstream in the supply chain to how to understand that risk. So yes, it's, um, it's important, but at the moment, the tools that we have are a little blunt and need sharpening if we're going to really enable and create value for the, um, for the, for the supply chain. And if you talk about the tools, we have tools, but they're a little bit blunt. What, what tools, i.e. what systems at the moment uh, are working best, in your opinion, to determine origin? And I'm thinking especially the tools that are uh, appropriate for the vast number of small and SMEs that are uh, predominating in this colored gemstone supply chain. Well, I, I, I guess from our um, spec, um, perspective, we're, we're kind of strong believers in that you need to have um, choice and you need to have specific tools for specific circumstances. So we don't advocate for any one particular tool. And really our first step, and I think anybody's first step, is to understand the system first. Systems are there in place because they create, um, they create value. And in something like gemstone supply chain, they've been creating value for thousands of years and for many families and generations. Um, so we don't advocate for, for one, but let me give a kind of a few examples. Um, 
as far back in uh, 2008, I launched with um, Walmart and Sam's Club, those two very big retailers in the States, the first fully traceable gold jewelry and the first fully traceable um, diamond jewelry right up to the mine. And that was based on a quite sophisticated technology platform, um, you know, a precursor to the blockchain um, platforms that we'll hear from, from probably from Monica as, as well. And that was appropriate for that particular supply chain because Walmart has um, um, quite a lot of heft in the supply chain and the resources to do that. Um, but then we also developed a program for, um, for, for TIN in the DRC, and that was a paper-based program because they didn't, simply didn't have the access to the technology to do that. Um, you might, might not know, we also have, um, I also have my own jewelry company called uh, Macau, co-founded with some, um, some of my friends there. And there we have a direct relationship with mines in Honduras. So there we're allowed to have complete control over the, over the supply chain. And that's another system. And our work with small scale gold miners in East Africa, there we are looking at um, blockchain as well and seeing how we can um, figure out the business case to make that, that work. So I think, you know, my kind of message there are that first we need to understand the system and then we need to look at the technology and the different apparatus that you can put in place to augment that system rather than um, undermine or disrupt it. And there are different options which are appropriate for small um, producers um, as well as um, large producers who might have the technology. And one thing we've got to avoid, especially in the colored gemstones when um, most, if not all, are small producers in one way or another is the risk of excluding small producers from that supply chain. Thank you. And that's an appropriate point to bring in Monica. Um, Monica, with, with Moyo Gems, you've developed a fully traceable supply chain for the gemstones that you sell. And, and it's a very inclusive supply chain going direct to the women in Tanga in Tanzania with the Tawoma, the Tanzanian Women's Mining Association. Tell us more about how you've done it and why it is important for the women, but also for your customers and the obvious end consumer as well. Absolutely. Um, and first of all, I have to point out that Moyo Gems is a collaboration. And you mentioned a couple of the partners when you introduced me, and there is absolutely no way that I would be able to do this um, strictly on my own uh, with my company, Anza Gems. We also uh, have Stuart Poole of 1948 is a uh, gemstone trader partner. Uh, Emmanuel Piet uh, in Paris just recently joined us as well. So that's exciting. Um, we uh, partner with PACT, uh, international NGO, Christina Villegas is on this uh, chat. She uh, has already commented a little bit about what they do. Uh, they're worldwide with um, really uh, extensive artisanal mining programs all over the world. And um, we also, uh, Tawoma is a huge partner for us, the Tanzania Women Miners Association. Um, so it's a really unusual partnership in the jewelry industry. Um, uh, hopefully we're seeing more and more collaborations um, where we're all sort of playing to our strengths. Uh, we provide the commercial part of things, but PACT and Tuoma provide a lot of the assurances and the, the background work and the scaffolding that enables us to do what we do. Um, we, the project was originally inspired by the Gemological Institute of America Artisanal Mining Training Program, um, which uh, Robert Weldon traveled to uh, East Africa, to Tanzania, to Tonga, and the Tuoma group was chosen. Uh, they worked with PACT. And the Tuoma group is, has strong leadership, great um, work on the ground with uh, about 3,000 miners across the country. Um, but they focused on women miners in uh, Tonga specifically. And uh, when, when they, I heard about this program after they had been back to visit, um, after they had done the original pilot and the women were excited, they were energized, they were, they, they finally knew more about what they were digging out of the ground. It's incredibly hard work and they suddenly had some visibility into how they can sort and uh, a little bit of, of insight into market value. So we decided to take it one step further and actually bring a sustainable international market to them uh, in, in their villages 
and uh, not just buy their gemstones, but actually kind of scaffold and, and uh, empower them to kind of participate more fully. So uh, in order to do that, we developed a program with the women in conversation. We, we heard their challenges. We tried to understand what it was that they would want from a market, not what we think a, a market should look like for them. And we, uh, building on that GIA education, uh, all of the, the miners participating needed to be members of Tawoma. Most of those are women. There are a few men who are, are members and who are able to participate in the program as well. It's kind of about gender equity. Um, we, uh, we asked that they complete the GIA training. Uh, they also were able to attend free occupational health and safety training conducted by a Tanzanian engineering firm um, uh, in their villages for free before the first market day. Um, we also wanted to move towards kind of a craft um, CRAFT standard um, for gemstones, um, which had only been applied to gold up until recently. And in order to do that, we wanted to kind of introduce this idea of legality as well. So we made sure that the women were all licensed um, by the Tanzanian government for their mining claim. Uh, all of those licenses were checked uh, against the regional mining office by PACT. So this is where our partners all come in. Um, Tawoma knows who the miners are, where they're from, what they mine. And so the way the market days work is I sit um, at the buying table with an, a Tanzanian export broker. I sit across from the, the miner, usually women, um, who has a local broker representing their interests. And they, um, we, we negotiate, um, I see their gems, we negotiate if there's a transaction, I actually pay the, the woman sitting across from me um, and she's getting, um, keep in mind, this is radically shortening the supply chain. She's getting 95% of the export price and she turns and she pays her broker uh, the 5%. So this is a, a really um, incredible shift in terms of the power dynamics of like, she now knows her value, what she's worth. She's able to negotiate uh, with a, an international trader. Um, and then we have done interviews with the women after um, these market days and they're getting three to 10 times what, the, uh, uh, what they would normally get from a local broker. Um, but, but, the, but the interesting thing is we've radically, because we've radically shortened the supply chain, the side benefit is I know exactly who this gem is from, um, and we know what the beneficiation is for this transaction. And, and you know, eight to ten times the value, that's, a, that's an extraordinary amount. Um, three, three to ten times, just to be... Just three to, be, to ten, sorry, yeah. Three to ten. And, you also, in the program, you incorporate a blockchain element into it. Now, blockchain, of course, is that buzzword that everybody's been talking about for a number of years now. Now, how has this worked out in practicality, in, in on the ground solution for you? And the bigger question, is blockchain the solution for the gem industry to provide full traceability from your experience? So because we have this incredible transparency, right? Um, the, the gem is no longer changing hands seven to 10 times before it leaves the country um, and losing that, that traceability kind of with each of those transactions, why not take the additional step of actually documenting this through blockchain? Um, we were very fortunate that early on Everledger approached us um, using the Providence Proof platform to actually be a part of this and, and participate actively. Uh, a few years ago, I think people would have said that it, was it would be impossible, like complete full stop, not possible to trace artisanal gemstones from the mine to, to the consumer. And um, actually, I, I have to say like that it is, it is actually possible. So the way this works is they are also, they have sent a representative to each of the market days after the first market day, which their technology wasn't quite ready yet. 
Um, but after that first market day, there's been a representative. Thank you, Monica Kashi, by the way, if you're um, on this at all. Um, she, uh, the, the representative will photograph, it's a geotag photo, and record all of the details of that either gemstone or parcel. And that gets uploaded, you know, depending on the, uh, you know, the actual connectivity, right, which is, which is a big challenge. Um, and, but that, that re uh, transaction is recorded at the time of purchase at the market day. Um, and then those assets can be transferred to me, um, where I, I have all of my gems cut um, in the US. So it's a very traceable, everything is assigned a very specific number that maps back to that miner. So it goes through this process. Um, and then ultimately all of those assets can be transferred, you know, to each player in the system and then finally to the consumer. The, pra you. the practical application of that is a little, um, we do a good job, I think, of telling our story and that traceability. So not as many people have asked us for that actual, you know, uh, blockchain transfer of assets until recently. And, and Risha, can I turn to you and, and bring you in? Because, you, you know, your work has has focused on industry issues, your writing work and your, your journalistic work. But as we can hear there from from the previous three speakers and especially from Monica, there's there's a yeah. there's a movement to go direct to the consumer and to shorten the pipeline, as as Monica was saying. So you work with a lot of gem dealers and how how can they stay relevant? in the conversation? How can they add value? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I mean, I, I, I work as a journalist and a storyteller, so not specifically with any particular segment in the industry. Now, you know, we're living in an era of disintermediation. And when I look at these conversations that are happening in the gemstone industry, I, I feel coming from the aviation and travel and tourism background, I feel a little, a little bit like, you know, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Mm. Because if we look at the travel and tourism and the aviation sector, 20 years ago, when after 9-11, you know, airlines went from um, giving travel agents 9% commission on every ticket to 0% overnight. And at that time, um, every you know the industry was like, okay, this is it. This is the end of the travel agent because airline, airlines are creating these online portals and uh, they're putting their inventory there. You know, consumers can just go and buy whatever they want to. And it's such a perishable commodity. Once that plane door closes, it's done. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, but that didn't happen. And it's important to look outside the industry to other industries and learn lessons from what um, worked in those industries. And why it didn't happen was because um, in some markets, airlines realized that, you know what, I don't have the domain knowledge. I might have the technology and technology has always been, um, has always enabled um, disintermediation disruption. And so when they, when, you know, they landed up, airlines landed up reintroducing sort of productivity linked bonuses and little contracts here and little contracts there. And 20 years down the line, when we look at the travel companies that are successful and who survived that period and are flourishing, uh, well, barring aside what's going on with COVID right now, but, um, um, you know, it's, it's companies who were able to pivot, who were able to innovate, who were able to bring value. So to answer your question specifically in the context of um, the gemstone sector, it's, um, I would say, you know, add value. Uh, I would say bring new things to the table, narrow your focus so that you can build your brand, specialize. Um, and I think um, that uh, innovation is the key to um, staying relevant uh, because, uh, and, and one key thing that happened in the travel and tourism sector, which can easily, which is happening in the gemstone sector as well, is that um, travel companies went from being agents to becoming advisors and consultants mm. and curators of travel experiences. And that worked beautifully. And I think a lot of people in the gemstone industry 
have started doing that. They are going beyond uh, just uh, providing the goods to actually working with jewelry designers on, you know, with this type of a stone, uh, you're better off with a yellow gold or this, or you should set this in this manner because this will protect the stone. And, and are actually getting involved in the conversation. Jewelry designers today are um, quite happy on their Instagram to show what they're working on and tag the person that they sourced the so stone from. Uh, yeah. because they're including them in the storytelling of what their brand stands for. So I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And, um, and I think, um, yeah, and, and, and within the industry and from outside, so. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, that's really important, those, those ways that, that merchants and dealers can add value. I mean, if I can add one, and you know, you've touched on it already, it's, it's collaboration. Um, you know, the way that you work together as a, a collective to, to build a bigger story. And an example of that, uh, you know, as Monica said, is, you know, the Moyo Gems is very much a collaboration between now three dealers, um, Piat having joined recently. And thank you for mentioning that, Monica. If we stay on, on with, with you, Risha, but we think about the, the need to romance the stone, the, the storytelling that's so important to our industry. What is the industry doing well and what can it improve on on the storytelling front right so you know something my dad always used to tell me was that um you know and i want to um sort of distinguish between storytelling and marketing for a second if i may but uh, one of the things my dad always used to say was that if your marketing is great your sales is automatic mm -hmm. and a lot of times um people confuse storytelling with marketing and the difference being with marketing, you're talking about customer segmentation, distribution, pricing, the sort of nuts and bolts, uh, which we're all familiar with. Storytelling is, um, you know, more about there's a there's a larger human element in the narrative. It's more about life. It's about humanity. It's taking um, an idea, an intellectual idea, and adding emotion to it and making it personal, making it real. So in a, in a, in a marketing context, you may present the best uh, version of yourself in a storytelling context. You know, I would encourage you to not just talk about the good stuff, but also talk about the challenges and talk about the difficulties um, and, and how challenging it is to bring that stone um, you know, whether you're a merchant, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're a miner um, to market. And in terms of what people are, um, what the industry could do more of, um, I think uh, many people are doing fantastic things. I think when we think about origin, uh, there is a natural tendency to think about history. Um, historic origins, you know, when you look at Colombia, Burma, the mind automatically gravitates towards uh, history and museums and, um, mm. you know, the uh, era gone by, or we think of um, travel, or we think of like, like you were mentioning, and we were discussing earlier about um, Tanzania and Tanzanite or Savorite uh, and Kenya and, you know, uh, travel related sort of conversations and narratives. But I think there's an opportunity to do so much more in terms of storytelling. Let's talk about uh, geology, you know, uh, the forces of Mother Earth uh, that come together to create this uh, mineral um, miracle. And um, let's talk about how, talk about yourself in that story. Um, and I wanna give an example here of, um, uh, from Colombia, actually, a chap called George Smith, who has an Instagram handle called Muzo Emeralds. And, you know, he's an English guy based in Colombia who's um, sharing not just images and videos of uh, the stones, but he's sharing um, uh, visuals about life in Colombia, of people, uh, food, uh, the culture. And he's showing things you know, he's showing the dark and the gritty stuff as well. And, um, and what that does uh, by sharing a piece of your life. So, you know, if you're 
um, uh, in Jaipur or in Bangkok or in Chantaburi or in Kenya, wherever you are, show what your life is like. Um, don't just focus on the transactional element of the stone. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think that helps connect people to your um, story. And I think tell your story, use the platform to tell your story. And I think that's, that's, that is what I would like to see more of. Thank you. I, I just checked out George Smith. He's got 146,000 followers on Instagram. So he must be doing something of interest in terms of education. I, I want to give one more example, if I may. very Briefly, quickly. if you can. Sure, sure. So I think another example is a chap called Dave Bindra, um, Jim Fluenzer. You know, he, the only thing he does in the videos is he's taking these stones and he's an avid shoe collector and he's matching sneaker collector and he's matching the color of the stone to the color of his sneakers. That's it. It's simple. There's no, there's n there are no paragraphs written. It's his style. The thing, the thing that I want to emphasize here with both these examples is, you know, sometimes you look at something that someone is doing and it's working really well for them. And you're like, right. I can do something like this. And again, the tendency is to try and mimic or mirror or copy uh, that style. The problem with the copying is that you can take that, but you can never graduate from that style or develop yeah. it further because it's not yours. So I would encourage people to try and figure out what is a style that works for you, for where you are and in the context of your world. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to bring it to education. You mentioned the importance of, of using um, knowledge about geological process and things like that. And Michael, can I bring you in and, and, and really think when we're talking about the marketing of gemstones, how important is education? And I know that uh, education is very important for SSCF and you've re recently launched a lot of courses online um, for free. Um, uh, how important is education for the future of the industry, especially as it relates to gemstone origin and the sales process? Yes, I mean, I think uh, education is absolutely key because it actually uh, brings together on one side uh, the knowledge about material for a buyer, for a consumer, and it also brings in the story. I mean, Richard told it, and I think it's really something which has a fascinating side to understand what you are buying, to get knowledge about the geological wonder. Yes, how is it possible to have such a beautiful stone formed is adding value and is adding a, a beautiful new facet to a material. So education, I think, is, is, is very important on all levels. I mean, it starts for people, consumers to, to address a stone correctly to know what they are talking about actually and to go deeper then for people in the trade to to know the challenge which is there what is a challenge in terms of treatment what kind of options you have for origin determination on a scientific base and what is the paper trail or blockchain options which kind of assist this and finally, even for the miner, I mean, it's absolutely crucial that these people know what they are doing. I was in Africa working as a geologist for, for, for mining companies for color stones, sapphires way back more than 20 years. And it was so enlightening to me to see what they know about the stones, but certainly also for them to see what is my view on this material. And they are waiting and hoping that this information is coming and I think that's one of the duties of, of the trade to supply this information on all these levels and we as an organization and as a non-profit uh, foundation are trying from our perspective and our possibilities to supply uh, this transparency in terms of uh, causes uh, uh, putting open access publications and talks so that people on I make promotion on their website, they find a lot of information and it's for free. And I think it's really important. Thank you. Ashton, I wanna bring back to the conversation to responsible sourcing, which is a term that many people like to use. Some people will say it's overused. Um, does knowing the gemstone's origin mean the seller can market it as responsibly sourced? Huh. 
That's a that's a great that's a great question, and I think you know there's 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 two different uh, there's two different parts to this story. I think one is where does it come from, and the other one is it is it produced in a way that can be understood to be responsible. So traceability alone, knowing where it comes from, doesn't necessarily imply that it's been um, sourced responsibly. Um, but really, what I think we're trying to do is build confidence in the supply chain that from wherever it comes from, it's sourced responsibly. And I think there's potential kind of risks of linking irresponsible production to certain places, as I kind of, um, as my remarks hopefully kind of made clear um, from from the out, outset. Um, but just touching on saying that kind of on, on two things, one that Risha said, um, talked about, and the other one about Michael, that, you know, the, the, the experiences and, um, uh, and bringing yourself into the experience is very important. So I mentioned that um, I co-founded a brand called Macau, and Macau is very much kind of a personal experience of responsible sourcing from a mine in Honduras, which was started by one of our partners. And um, that has been really kind of one of the most positive things we've had um, when we talk to our customers is how that began and where it came from and the reasons. And not just that, but also the challenges that, that we had. And that's where the education bit comes from, I think, mm -hmm. is that um, customers are a lot more sophisticated, I think, than people give them credit for, and especially than they were maybe 20, 30 years ago. And they are inquisitive. And they know that um, sourcing things responsibly is, is a complicated idea, especially when you source many different places, um, and they want to know more. So I think um, for those who are selling jewellery, being able to um, be part of that educational kind of process is also important because people do want to know more, and they don't expect everything to be 100% perfect. So one of our long-standing clients in um, another sector, um, a company called Fairphone, which, which sells fair cell, um, cell phones, they've made it a virtue in their brand to talk about their challenges and tell the story on their blogs of how they did actually do responsible sourcing for gold, for example, and where they went to and how difficult it was and how they lost track of the supply chain and how they rebuilt it and so on and so forth. So I think we can bring responsible sourcing into the storytelling and we can bring education as part of the sales strategy um, as well and start of that storytelling too. Um, and then I think we'll um, be able to see responsible sourcing not just as a cost, but as a value generation. Right, thank you. And, and I'd like to turn to bring in the, the voice and the needs of the consumer, giving the customer what they want. And Monica, if I can, turn to you for this. Proving coloured gemstone origin is challenging, um, but possible, as, as we've heard from you and, and from others. Now, accurately identifying who mined my gem is another step, and this is something that you've been working on. Have you found that the market asks for and is willing to pay for this granular tracing of gemstones, where you not only identify the mine, but you even identify the person who physically mined the gem. So uh, this was definitely an experiment because when we started doing this a couple of years ago, our, our first market day was in uh, almost exactly um, this date in May in 2019. We really had no idea what the market response was going to be. We just had a hunch that this would be uh, attractive to the market um, based on the storytelling that I had been doing for several years before that with Anza. And what we found is that um, people are listening, that our, our customers are the uh, designers and retailers who are interested in that level of not just traceability, but also responsibility, like understanding, because we're our value is not so much in the where, it's in the who uh, that it comes from, right? The where is just kind of uh, part and parcel of, of what we do. So um, from a value standpoint, people are, are responding, they are um, they're listening <laughs> to, to things like this where we can tell the story. Um, and we, we've been very successful, particularly in 2020. I feel like people were really listening, really tuning in, really um, tapping into kind of how can I be more responsible in, in, in my sourcing? People taking a step back from their business and, and understanding the black and brown communities where a lot of these gemstones come from. Um, but we, we also are very cognizant that we can have a great story, but unless we have beautiful gems that actually 
are within a market value, we don't have a sustainable product, right? Um, uh, from from a continual, uh, you know, generation standpoint. So we um, we've been very pleased that people have been buying and using these gemstones in beautiful jewelry. I'm actually wearing. Uh, a piece by Annabella Chan um, and her designs have been featured in British Vogue using Moyo gems. Um, so, you know, the market response has been amazing, but we also have to be within the market value. And because we've radically shortened that supply chain, we are able to give, I think, still a, a very good value. And it's important to remember things like Fairmine Gold, you know, people have been willing to pay that little bit of a premium knowing that that premium goes back to the communities it comes from. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an important part of the equation. If people know that there's beneficiation with a hopefully not out of whack market price, then I think that um, it, it just reinforces the value. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I can't believe where the time has gone. It's already... Um... Uh, it's already an hour and you know we did have some more questions and I do want to encourage the audience if you have some questions please do pop them at the Q&A we've got a few there already but we'd like to select from a few more um Risha can I can I ask you briefly you started as a consumer and how important do you think and do you see from your interactions with your consumers on Instagram how important is origin to consumers? Well, you know, when you, when you invited me to um, participate in this panel discussion, um, I think origin is very important uh, to consumers. Um, and, but I think the reasons why origin is important to consumers is maybe different from what we think it is. And, I, um, and when you invited me for this webinar, I kind of use this as, an opportunity to uh, conduct some research. And I reached out to different people from LA to Shanghai um, across the pipeline, asking them this question, like how many of your clients actually ask you uh, about origin? And when I, uh, and they said, oh, so many of them. I said, okay, now how many of your clients ask you whether this gemstone is responsibly sourced? And that figure just dropped. Mm. And um, mm. I was surprised to see that um, it was ranging between 5% to max 30%, depending on which part of the planet uh, that person was located in. And, and, and so in terms of digging deeper as to why are they asking questions about origin and what is the motivation? The motivation is, you know, a client is approaching it first and foremost from the point of view of value preservation and value appreciation. And, 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 but when these people that I was talking to were telling me this, that, oh, you know, it's just a handful, it's a small percentage. Yes, it has definitely grown in the last um, five to 10 years. Uh, we are seeing more and more people asking questions. But when it comes to the responsible element of that question, it's a small, still a max 30%. And, then they would tell me the things that they do to educate their clients. What is it that they said, but we tell them, you know, it's, I, I'm passionate about it. So I tell them this and I do this. And, and they went on to talk about, and, and, it, and I kept thinking about this um, in the days leading up to today. And, and I realized that, you know, there's, there is this narrative that's out there about this ideal consumer who knows everything, who wants to know everything, who's very concerned. And, um, and while that consumer does exist, I sometimes feel that the narrative is louder than the reality. Um, and I feel that that consumer is actually you. And when I say you, I mean the industry. You know, you are that consumer who is passionate about yeah. responsible sourcing. You are that consumer who is um, who cares about doing things in the proper way. There are different motivations behind that viewpoint. Um, you know, some, some people are, are care about it because they have either visited the mines or they've been to manufacturing centers or they just want 
to have a positive impact with their business practices. Yeah, yeah. Of course, people also don't want to get into trouble. Uh, you know, uh, c- consumers or people in the industry don't want to um, do something, have a misstep, which then is risky for their business or yeah. for themselves. And so, so I feel that yes, but but yeah. Uh, you know, they do care about origin. And I think the other reason they care about origin, and I'm going to wrap this up quickly now, is nice. also because they don't, um, they clutch onto origin as a way of trying to understand quality and whether they are making the right purchase or not. So in, in you know, I get questions on uh, my Insta account all the time, like, I want to buy a serious emerald if I have to buy a serious emerald, does it have to be Colombian only? Or I think that's uh, that's a I, really important you know, point, Risha. Yeah. You're you're right. Thank you. You know there is there is this association between origin and and quality. Michael, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Uh, I think that's really very important points you mentioned, Risha. I would like to add another another one. Actually, we have to see gemstones are not consumables. It's not something every year you have to have new ones and the old is gone. I mean, the stock of stone, the recycled gems is immense, is huge. And I'm talking now here about the really important rubies, sapphires, emeralds. I mean, these stones, they come from a place, but it is not feasible and possible to now trace it granularly back to who has actually found the stones. Origin in this concept is much wider and we have to see at the very end, yes, there is a huge interest in the market from the consumers. And at the very end, I agree, it has to do also with value. It has to do with investment. And it might be a different situation if we talk about a citrine and a amethyst, which is rather like it's once used and when it's not anymore necessary, these stones are, are, are left out somewhere. What we see as a lab, and that's now our segment of the market is mostly stones which are old, in the market and recut and repolished since since decades. And this material is, it's different to integrate. And I think tracking options like a gem track at least give you a journey through the trade. And we have seen the stone 30 years ago and we see it now again, so it's still the same stone. But how it was found, the claims about responsible mining, this indeed is not possible to make anymore. Okay, thank you. Now, we we really have gone over, but I'd like to get some questions. But for final thoughts from each of you, briefly, and can I stress, please, briefly, um, quick fire questions to each of you in turn. And Michael, because your microphone's on and ready, I'm going to go to you first. Will the origin of a gemstone ever become more important in determining value rather than its aesthetic appeal. I, which will be more important, the origin or the I beauty? Mean, I mean, look at the reality. And I think the reality, and I'm talking about the high-end market where beauty is already given at a certain point. The material is beautiful. The origin has a tremendous input on influence on the pricing. That's true. And this, I don't see to change uh, because this is kind of where the market drives on this part. It is already there personally, and that's my personal uh, uh, opinion on this, I would always go for the beauty. Okay, More thank fun. you. Ashton, can I come to you next quickly? Is it, is it the same question or are you give me another same, question? Same question, quick fire to all of you. Will, will the origin be more important in determining value or the aesthetic appeal? Well, I hope it will be the latter. I hope it will be the latter, but it's the, that, that's what creates the pure value. And if we can also add on specific information, how that's responsibly source, that'll augment the, um, the intrinsic quality of the gemstone itself. Thank you. Good point. Monica, can I turn to you? Yes, um, I, I, would, I would just like to point out that a lot of the, the lab systems that we've talked about, GemTrack, um, GIA has a similar uh, program. Um, even other, you know, tracking mechanisms, even blockchain that we're using is not really intended for smaller players, nor is it intended, I I think Michael made this point, um, you know, the vast majority of the market is 
garnets or aquamarines, they, they cannot um, sustain that kind of price tag for the um, for that kind of origin tracing and tracking. Um, so we need to really think about the smaller players in, in the industry. We need to think about the artisanal side. How do we connect them? These shorter supply chains are more beneficial for them. It's, it's a side benefit is that incredible traceability. How, what, you know, we need to invest in tech systems that are actually supporting these artisanal miners. Good point, thank you. Didn't answer my question, but it's a very important point that you made. So I wanted I'll to make sure to make that point. I'll let you get away with it, Monica. <laughs> okay. Risha, <laughs> last, last, last word to you on that same question, aesthetic appeal or origin for the value? You know, I was actually having this conversation on Clubhouse, uh, origin versus beauty. And um, of course, I think with education, and I think as consumers, um, and when I say consumers now, I'm not just talking about the end consumer, but I think also in the pipeline. As people get uh, more educated and learn more about different um, facets, um, they will come to appreciate beauty more. And I think the ones who are more knowledgeable do appreciate beauty and consider beauty above origin. However, when we were having this conversation, someone said, you know, but I, when I was at a trade show, the minute someone pulled out a stone, the first question they, uh, the other guys asked was, oh, where is it from? So origin will always, I think, uh, be there um, as an anchor, as whatever you want to call it. But I mean, I would hope in the future, it leans more towards beauty. Thank you. We've got a really interesting comment just coming in the chat from Michael Hing. Firstly, hi, Michael, I haven't seen you in years, but it's great that you're with us. And he's made a really important point in the chat. He says, I think it's important to note that most consumers have no idea how to evaluate the quality or beauty of a stone. Origin, however, is easily understandable and can be documented in a relatively objective manner. Uh, we could discuss that for a long time, but I just wanted to throw it out there as a good comment. Uh, we do have some great questions and I'd like to get to them. And I really am gonna stress if you can answer them briefly because everybody's busy and I'm sure they've got places to go to, um, but there's some good questions here. There's one from Vahid, which I'd like to address firstly to Ashton, but if anybody else would like to answer it, please join afterwards. Is it possible to set up a legal system for all colored stones, such as there is with diamonds, referring to the Kimberley process, to determine the origin of all of them. Now, the Kimberley process doesn't necessarily determine the origin. However, I think we take his point. Yes, the Kimberley process looks at particular um, particular countries. But I think, I mean, Michael's probably the expert on this. But I mean, the when you're talking about colored gemstones, what are we talking about? 60, 70 different um, species of, of gemstones coming from um, an extraordinary number of, of countries, different ways of valuing them. I, I think it's simply not possible and not necessarily desirable. And we've been talking a lot about um, um, SMEs um, in, the, in, the spy, in the supply chain and traders in particular. I think we should remember that they play a very important role because they're able to create value for different segmented markets. You know, we should talk about how to segment the markets. Um, and that, that I think is the beauty of the of the colored gemstone supply chain is that you have these traders, they know their markets very well, and so they can mix and match and augment um, different types of gemstones and different type of markets and find value for them. And some would argue in the diamond trade that has evaporated because it's become um, too homogenous. So I don't think we want to lose the diversity in it. And there's um, there's a tendency for standardization to lose that diversity. So we've got to find a way to standardize the right thing while encouraging that very rich diversity in the supply chain. Right. Did anybody else want to comment on that? KP for the colored stones. It's, I, I think it's been well covered by Ashton, so thanks. We've got another question here from, from Sandrine. Um, responsible sourcing comes at a higher cost. And for people like myself who are at the beginning of their career, while still studying, uh, it's it's difficult. So, is there any organisations that can help um, with with helping people buy responsibly? Monica, can I turn to you for this? So, um, 
I think that uh, this last year has really shown a spotlight on the need for reducing barriers to people just emerging in the industry to um, particularly to, you know, again, black and brown uh, communities um, and, and people who are trying to kind of get into uh, an industry that can be very exclusive and, and really quite expensive. Um, some, some responsible products come with a slightly higher price tag because you can kind of hear uh, from this conversation of the assurances and the background of, of what you're doing to um, be able to accurately claim responsible um, those come with a cost sometimes, uh, and sometimes those costs get passed along. Um, there are a couple of organizations, um, for instance, like Ethical Metalsmiths, um, where you can join a community who can kind of share knowledge and resources about um, products that are on the market. Um, in terms of anyone providing, you know, majorly discounted, a number of gemstone dealers that I know would be very happy to open their vaults. And um, if, if, you know, perhaps there's a way, maybe, maybe we can create a clearinghouse for some uh, very discounted or even uh, free gemstones for people who are emerging in the industry, because it, it, it is an expensive mistake um, when you're just starting out to invest quite a bit in, um, a particular gemstone only to chip it or, or um, you know, not be able to sell it. So uh, maybe that's something to put on the list. Thank you, Risha, you had something to add. Yeah, I just wanna add uh, that, you know, coming back to the point I'd made earlier that now you have a new, um, um, a new breed of gem merchants who are also looking to collaborate with new designers and, um, and do these collaborations. Uh, so um, I would encourage you, Sandrine, to connect with um, someone and um, work in a collaborative fashion uh, rather than in a more traditional fashion where you're taking stones on consignment and then, you know, so, and, and involve them in your storytelling as you're developing uh, your brand. Ashton, you had something to add, please. Well, Jess, you were, um, yeah, said you, you mentioned at the beginning um, and introducing that um, we've launched with some brands a free resource and um, community platform, um, which is both educational and allows traders and buyers and miners to 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 connect. Um, so I encourage you all to have a look at that. I've just put the um, URL oh, thank in, you. The, um, in the chat and the Q and A. Thank you for beating me to it. Um, to put the, the link in the chat. I also put the link in the chat to Sibjo's own responsible sourcing toolkit, which was very much facilitated by uh, the Coloured Working Group and yourselves at TDI Sustainability. So thank you, Ashton, for that. Um, we're at 18 minutes past. We could talk about this for possibly another hour, but I think we'll leave that to another day. We have had such great interaction from all of you, especially in the chat today. So um, when I finish in a minute after our, after our endings, I will leave the webinar open for some time so that you can read through what's written in the chat because there's a wealth of information, a wealth of links. I think you've all had, especially you, Monica, your PR agencies have been tapping out lots of different <laughs> links in there to all of excellent resources so thank you to everybody for being such a collaborative community and helping each other to to learn what's going on here um i, I really appreciate everybody's time gaetano I, I know you like to 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 have a few words at the end can i please offer the stage to you but can i also ask you to be brief thank you thank you very much and uh i want to thank uh, all the panelists really uh, have uh, listened in a very religious way uh, every single word you said and for this i thank you your contribution is truly important and massive uh, i saw that uh, we have uh, nearly 220 friends online uh, and evidently unfortunately a number nearly 80 left but um, I would like to make a consideration. And the consideration is this, apart my thanks to everybody. Uh, 
we have talked about origin, about uh, uh, importance of the, the science, about technology, about storytelling, about marketing, about research. But uh, there is one thing that I would like to mention, which is the human effect and uh, the uh, contribution that uh, the human effect may have. And when I say human effect, I refer to all the people involved in the supply chain, from the miners, so the human rights, from the mining company, respect of people and the environment, from the traders, respect and uh, uh, having the honesty to uh, disclose everything, from the reputation of the people and the credibility of the people. Because at the end, as Risha was saying, we are all consumers and we can never forget that because the consumer, as I have repeated extensively, we may have great success or we may have a great failure. So in terms of respect of the human effect from human rights to democracy, to the right and to the duties that each one of us we have, we have to consider and think constantly that we all contribute to the reputation of our industry. And if our industry has a good reputation because all of us, then uh, uh, we will continue in doing more and doing better. And there is always big, big, big room to doing better and doing more. I would like to extend my invitation to all of you, and I would like to thank you for great contribution to the industry. Thank you very much. I second that, and I'll wrap up by thanking the audience for being with us. Thank you very much for, for bearing with us as we went 23 minutes over time. That's a record for us. Um, but I, I feel it was all very worthwhile. Um, Ashton, thank you so much for your time. Um, we look forward to further collaborations between TDI and the Color, Colorstone Working Group and Sibjo, um, and all the best to your team. Uh, Michael, it's been great having you with us. Please send our, our regards to Laurent, who was a previous guest with us here in, in Jewelry Industry Voices. Uh, Risha, it's the end of your day. Uh, you fully deserved a glass of wine and settle and rest into the rest of your evening. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to yeah. seeing you on Instagram. And Monica, you're going to have a great day. This is a great start, I hope. But I wish you all the very best for the rest of your day over there on the West Coast. Thank you finally to Gem Cloud, to our um, sponsors, um, not just for this webinar, for, for all the other spot, uh, webinars that we've been doing this season, Natural Diamond Council, Platinum Guild International, and also Uni Diamonds. We will be back next month, as always, on the first Thursday of the month, which will be Thursday, June 3rd. You will receive information about that if you're on Sibjo's email list and if you follow us, follow us on social media. I can't guarantee we can get as many followers on our Instagram as Risha has and as George Smith has, um, but we're uh, trying to build it all the time. So please like us and follow us on social media. So thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to you, the guests, for your participation. Um, we'll see you that next month. Please, everybody, stay safe and follow government guidance wherever you are. And as I've often said before, please take the vaccine when you can, if you can. As I said earlier, I will leave the webinar open for a while, but from me and everybody else, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>